I want to start this interview by asking, taking you a bit back into your career and asking, when you left the last Egypt Eighty Band to start the positive force, what were your goals again? To play good music, to prove I left my father to be my own man, which was very important. People couldn't understand this. I needed to find myself, find my identity, and be myself, basically speaking. I didn't want to be, I wasn't planning on taking over my father or being his replica or his protege or whatever they wanted to call it. I wanted to be Femi Anukula Pokuti. Who will always be Fela's son? So, would you say those goals, aim and aspirations came as planned later than expected or earlier than expected after the release of your first body of work, Femi Kuti, 24 years ago? It was difficult, but I, I, knew, I always knew it would be difficult. I didn't expect the backlash to be as bad as it was. I didn't expect it to last as long as it did. Every negative article or negative review made me stronger to prove my point. I never believed. My point was I'd rather die, die trying than not even try at all. I didn't know how long it would take me to prove my point. I didn't even really know if I would prove my point, but I knew I did not want to be under my father's roof anymore. I knew I wanted to set out to find myself. And it was like somebody just swimming out into the ocean, not expecting if you ever see dry land again. And I just set out. And I didn't care about the consequence of that action, but I knew that decision in my life at that time I had to take. So after that decision, did the plans work out earlier? Like earlier than expected. expected. Or... Uh, it would be difficult to give a, a time duration because I didn't have any time. So all I know is I didn't expect so much negative negativity from the outside world as I from my own people. So I really got my break in France and in Europe and then in America before Nigeria. People wanted to hear what I had to offer. In Nigeria it was, you are not like your father. You must be like your father. Uh, nothing less than your father, we don't want to hear. So I said to make my name, I got all my big deals outside Nigeria. I said to make money to survive outside Nigeria. It took me approximately 10 years before and this was with the track Wonder Wonder before people wanted to even listen to my music. And then with Wonder Wonder, it was um, everybody believed my father wrote the song. And then Bang 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 came out in 98. And it was still very quite difficult for them to give me credit. But they had to give me credit because my father had passed. I'm sure if he was alive, they would have believed he wrote those songs on those albums. And so I wouldn't like to put a time on if I succeeded in what I wanted to accomplish, because I still believe I'm still doing my best to accomplish whatever I set out to accomplish. I probably will be, try, be doing this till I die, which is not a negative um, point of view of mine. It's just I set out this way. I don't think it would be difficult to say I'm perfect but I will always strive for perfection. I don't think perfection will ever come the way I want it. But the scene for me will be not striving for perfection every time. Every time I'm on stage, I have to prove a point. The older I get, I have to keep on proving that point at that point in time in my life. So there is no um, time for accomplishing that goal. But if you say, have I been successful? I would say I've been quite successful. Many times Grammy nominations, first Nigerian to win world music, first Nigerian to win Kora Award, um, the Kora Award, the world music. So many awards I have. Um, and then winning the awards brought another um, thought to my mind. Because when I was winning these awards, I didn't feel great. I just felt, so what? Because then I now understood that the message in my music was more 
more important than winning these awards. As long, what I was singing about was more meaningful. Poverty, bad roads, no electricity, no health care, and how bad our society was. No future for young people, even at my time, and it's worse now. So these things were more important. The message in my songs were more important than people saying, oh, you're a great musician. Oh, we like your show. It just gave me more motivation to keep on trying to get people to understand the importance of what I was singing about. Now this brings me to another question that I would have asked later on, but since you brought it up, let me ask. After four Grammy Awards nominations, are you hoping to win the President Award? I'm indifferent, honestly. I was indifferent when I was nominated the first time. Now, you have to understand the politics behind my music. And when I set out, if you don't, probably I will be forced to write my autobiography so people get a, my own point of view. But I'll try and summarize it. So when I was nominated the first time, I was basically going to win. Everybody knew I was going to win. The album was Fight to Win, very strong. Hard all, we had the uh, most death on it, um, Jaguar Ride, Come On. It was a super album. But then I was facing crisis in my career with my recording company in France because Bang 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 was so massive and everybody said I had made a lot of money. People, the press in Nigeria was saying I was a millionaire in euros. And when I, my musicians were thinking I was making all this money. So I had to now, I was forced to ask my company, where is this money? Then I won the world music, like I said, and they printed a pamphlet saying I sold over 500,000 copies. I mean, that's a lot of money. Even if I was selling it at 50 cents, that's a lot of money. So I go to the company and ask them, where is the money for bank, bank, bank? And they said, I've not even sold up to 45,000. And I was even still owing the company for all the publicity and remixes, blah, blah. And I said, wow, how did you arrive at this? But I just won this award. The award said I'd sold over 500,000. They said, all that was publicity gimmick. I said, yeah, okay. I was really heartbroken. So I called my manager, asked him to explain what this. He didn't give me a good explanation, so I sacked him. The recording company sacked me, saying that I should be grateful that coming from Lagos, Nigeria, that I have a French manager. So it was basically racism. So they got rid of me, but paid me a huge sum of money. I think they paid me about 20,000 euros, which I used to complete my bungalow at that time. So, and when they sacked me, France didn't inform America that they had dropped me. So the American company, which was MCA, had done all the political maneuvers to win. So everybody, Fem is nominated. The whole everybody said shouting, he's going to win. America, everybody was so sure. France now got to hear that, ah, uh -uh, we have dropped this artist. You are not supposed to give him any more promotion anywhere. And not only have we dropped him, he's been blacklisted. He's not going to tour anymore in his life. So I got to America, nobody met me at the red carpet, nobody met me at, normally they would have brought a limousine to the airport, I got there, I was stranded, and there was this girl from Zimbabwe, who now knew me, she used to work in the United Nations, she, she worked there, so they sent a car to pick me, they made arrangements, and they, I was, they gave me accommodation to stay till the nomination, so, but they were all still confident I was winning. When I saw the political maneuvers that, ah, uh, where is, my company, I will call them. They didn't pick my call. I said, look, there's no way I will win again. They said, you are still going to win. The publicity is too much for you. We got there. And I vowed that if I didn't win, I'll never, I'll never be interested anymore. I, I came up with a theory. Everybody wanted me to be there at the death of my father to take over. What if I died before my father? So the child waiting to inherit his father's wealth or his father's legacy. What if you die before your father? So, and that was my thought. This was my thinking at that time. Okay, everybody wants me to stay. What if I, I could die in an accident. Anything could kill me. So why should I wait to live my father's life? So, and then where is my own life? God created me too. Where is my life? Am I supposed to live my father's life or live my life? Am I going to be judged in heaven by living my father's life or my life? So this, this, was, this was how I was thinking. I said, look, if this is my thinking, I better set out to accomplish my own dream. Let me fail if I'm going to fail. Don't let me blame anybody. 
let me make my mistakes. And when I'm successful, let me learn from my success to even be more successful or whatever I, whatever thought comes to my mind again. Have you accomplished all this and over two decades after the death of your dad, who is also your boss, who was your boss, what do you miss most about having him around? His jokes. He was, he was quite a funny man. He, was, he had a way to just make the most terrible situation, situation funny. And we all just laugh about it. Maybe he was in a very prayerful mood or hopeful mood that I better be successful. Because then he even took me out of school. So I didn't have the general education everybody had. But then when I moved to Kalakuta, he gave me books like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Black Man. I said to read very big, heavy African books on African history, blah, blah. And I went really crazy in reading this book. So I'm quite informed on the historical facts of Africa. And so I think he, he took that big risk. And I think he said to realize he should have still given me that fundamental training between father and son. Because if he, not, even if somebody else had taught me how to read and write music, it would not have been the same like my father. There is just that fatherly connection that will have been there forever, that I will have been able to pass to my own children. So I think he said to realize this. So with my own son, when my son was born, because Madi met him, they said to connect, and we were like, wow, see, Fela and Madi having a good rapport. So we were amazed and it was very emotional for us because we, we didn't know it could be like that and him and Madi really connected as he always wanted to see Madi Madi was very and he, he was doing things that he never did to we his first children in that he had in the 60s so we i think we would have loved to see this transformation because I'm sure you'll have taught Madi how to read and write music. I'm sure you'll have come out of that his comfort zone to be a good grandfather with Madi. We said to see this in him at that time. So I think I miss that. We miss seeing that. This was a very big part of our life at that time before he passed. So the rapport I had with my father, so different from the conventional way. I was driving a car at 12. Can you imagine a 12 year old boy I'll put two pillows on the driver's seat. Police were chasing me all over Lagos. There was a police station, I'll never petrol police station at um, behind Obaniko. Those police, they knew because I was taking the car to school. I still remember the horn of the car. That was the horn of that car. So you can imagine that even at 56, if I still remember that horn, how I drove that car. When I come, I just come out white, white. I just come out of the car. Just posing. No future ambition. My the history teacher used to I think his name was Mr. Drake. He said some people will just be coming to school. Well, some people, the books are slaves to them. Some people are slaves to their books. You know, he was talking to me. Me in my desk. You see bread, moin moin, food. Ah. When they are teaching, I just be eating, eating. Everything, nothing is entering here. This place, nothing was inside there. Ah, then. Oh. So you see my life so different from the conventional way. So when anybody just saw me anywhere, oh fella, this one there is no for him in this life. Okay, I even have some friends that said before I'm 27 I'll be dead. I had a motorcycle, Harley Davidson. I would go from Ikeja to Sulere like in five minutes. Can you imagine how fast I was going? So my right, my life was so rugged and. But to most people, it was exciting, you know. I, I lived. And then suddenly that changed around. No, you are not, you can't change. You mustn't change. You have to be like, want to know how you have been then, you know. Ah, no, you can't change. And when I said to, I stopped smoking, I stopped, I was very focused. People didn't understand where I was coming from. And ah, when Buhari jailed my father, and the responsibility of leading the band and we were playing we arrived in america and 
this my father called me and said, ah, I don't think they're letting me come. Oh. You are going to have to lead the band. This big weight just fell over me and said, eh? I said, no, you have to come. He said, I can't come. I can't come. Okay, bye-bye. And he dropped the phone. His best friend at that time, Mr. J.K. Brimo, was sitting. He said, ah, you have to do it, oh. And you know what? You better get ready because we are playing at the Hollywood Bowl. Hollywood Bowl is where Michael Jackson them used to feel that we will be watching them in t on TV. It wasn't for me, it was for Fela. So, how can I lead the band? I think in this was 84, I was 22. No plan that Fela would die or something would happen that I will lead. So, never this never crossed my mind. So, I said to practice and I said, wow, that means no fun again. So, the first thought that came to my head was, I better stop smoking. So, I called my girlfriend who was in New York. I said, I stopped smoking. I want to say, please, I beg, tell me, so, tell me something else. Nobody can ever believe. I was smoking two packets of cigarettes of Marlboro. I was smoking marijuana. The only thing I didn't do was take alcohol or hard drugs. Because my father warned us against cocaine and things like this. He, he was so scared about that. He told us never to touch about marijuana. Hey, speciality. And cigarettes. Oh, God. <laughs> Two packets a day. Imagine. So, I just said, I've stopped smoking. He said, everything. I said, everything. He said, Femi, you know it's not possible. Blah, blah, blah. Smoke English for me. I said, okay. And that was how I stopped. We played at the Hollywood Bowl. And then, one of, I've for, forgotten the town. There was a big poster. Femi Anukula, Femi Kuti and Egypt 80. And I just said, wow, this is the future. I better now be focused. Then I moved to my mother's house when we go back to Lagos. But I still didn't understand the meaning of practicing and all that. I was still arrogant, fell son, who had everything. I mean, I had anything he could give me. So when I got to my mother's house, my grandmother called me and said, you have been here for two weeks. This is my maternal grandmother. And I've not heard you pick up your horn for one minute. What kind of lousy, bloody... She's very British, my mother's mother. Oh, she abused me. That was the second time I like cried in my life. That night, I cried that, how dare this woman talk to me, Femi and Nikola Kukuti like that? Eh? Can you meet me outside and talk to me like that? But as I'm talking rubbish in my head, I was realizing this, my grandmother, respect, eh? I miss her, I'm, I must be going crazy. I stopped smoking, but the withdrawal symptoms was as <laughs> me. Was I be worrying me? So, well, but that was the saving grace. That talk she gave me. I could I I could sleep all night and I just to pick up my own the next day. I could hear her telling my mother, bloody sod. I gave him a piece of my mind. Because every time I did power, I knew she was she's that kind of woman say, stupid boy. Who does he think he is? Fella son, my bloody foot. Ah shell, not in this bloody house. You bring fellas that in this house. I will tell you all that. She's so ah. Our mouth was like a razor blade. Okay, would you say that experience, you know, helped you? All that molded me too. Sa saxophone. Of course. So much that you actually were awarded um, sax in the method called circular breathing with a record of 51 minutes and 5 seconds. Definitely. On that day, I vowed again. You see, I'm that kind of person. When something happens to me like that, I just sit back. When my back is against the wall, I have to find a way. I either go through that wall, over that wall, but you are not going to get me there. I must find a way out. That is the kind of training I think I had. It's, and it's not the... My father just put me out there to find my way, and I had to find a way. So anytime my back was against the wall, I just said, wow, ah, I'm going to make this woman chew her words. Fortunately, she's my grandmother, so I will never be able to tell her that, well, what do you think today? But this, what she did to me that day was what saved my life. If it was my enemy that spoke to me like that, ah, that person will rest today. I will be on that person's case. So I will, ah, I will let that, I will show that person. So I just said, wow, from today, I'm going to start. I said to do 1,000 press-ups every day. 1,000 sit-ups every day. We were staying on the second floor in Bajula, Ishomolu. There was no water. So I had to fetch water through a well. I will fetch, I used to fill two bathtubs. Just 
this for me was basic training. So I would fetch the water, carry this big bath. I think they, that, you know, one bath is as tall as this. It's about this tall. I will feel, I will carry that probably God knows how many times from downstairs, second floor, fill the bath, then fill all the buckets, wash my mother's clothes, wash my grandmother's clothes, help my, sis my two sisters. Sometimes my friend Delicious Shosimi was staying with us there. He, he will do once, then he will just back off. But me, I, I saw it as I'm going to, I just took it against myself that I've misused my life all this time. How do I correct it? So I use this to build my muscles. There are some pictures you see. If you see my muscles then. Then I saw some pictures of like Arnold Schwarzenegger and all these people. So I thought I thought it was natural. So I wanted to build my body like that. I didn't know it was still as most of them were. But I had no idea of this. So I was just doing the impossible. I mean I would do a frog jump. I could do it through a corridor. God knows how many times. Then minimum six hours every day of playing the saxophone. Then I said to try to teach myself. So the way I count, I count like this. One. My cousin, cousin Francis, who died, said, you are the only musician that uses two legs to count. Because I just wanted to be different from everybody. I knew everybody counted with their left leg. One, two, one and two. But I didn't want So I, I said, me, I'll be counting. One and two and three and four and five. And she used to laugh at me because I look like a clown, kind of. But I just found, I had to find my own way to be different, to find my own footing. So, but this was what gave me I didn't know if I would make it, but I knew this was where I was going to go again. And then my father came out of prison. In the two years he spent, I had already built self-esteem, which was the, probably the most important thing for a musician. And I knew I wasn't going back. So I told my mother I'm not going back. At 56, your performance remains to for music and your fans, obviously. How do you judge strength? remain with every show of determination all those things focus it's, it's, it's hard at this age it's hard i don't know how long i'll be able to continue for scary now it's getting scary i mean i'm so hyper that i can't fall asleep after a performance it takes me hours to fall asleep when i even fall asleep i mean at a point where i don't even realize i'm sleeping i wake up and i'm still so tired it takes me days to recover so imagine doing 30 shows. I mean, by the time I come back, oh, I'm completely dead. But then when I build my, when I get my rest, I find the strength to continue again. And then my responsibilities are so much. I have about 10 children, adopted and biological. So I need to pay school fees, so I can't stop. So I put, again, I, I put so many things in my in my before that, don't allow me to retreat. So again, it's better I die than fail. Every night, like tonight, I'm going to give four hours, whether I like it or not. So it's not a case of, are you tired? Are you feeling sick? Is your body paining you? I don't give myself any excuses. I mean, I must be like close to death to say I will not climb the stage. So even if I had malaria, for instance, I would still play today. People say, why? My band leader, the leader of my band, Okwe, is always amazed that, because the standards I've set, he's saying, he always says, I don't give room for anybody in the band to even give. And most of them are 20, 15 years younger than I am, even much. So I don't give them any excuse not to turn up. We don't say because we don't have money, we mustn't perform because this was my training. We don't, it was, it's not because of money or material wealth we decide to play music. Anybody, if this is your motivation, you can't be in positive force. So all the standards are already there. Where you go, first focus, give a good concert. The money will come. I don't know when the money will come. The money has never failed to come. But don't come and tell me you want that money before, you must deliver before the money comes. You can't deliver a bad show then expect somebody to pay you. Give the best show you can give. Then when the money comes, and then I, will, I could do a lot of shows for free because I've seen five years from today. If somebody, if at the beginning of my career, somebody said, come and play in Hollywood Bowl for no money, I would not think of the, do you understand? I would think of the money. I would say, eh, Hollywood Bowl, the prestige of playing in Hollywood Bowl. No amount of money can give it to me. So I will do it. Somebody say, ah, he has collected money for it. 
but I didn't collect money. I've just seen that five years from today, that Hollywood Bowl I played will be in my CV. It will always be there. So, around the world, I've done so many shows, like, uncountable like this, that somebody will say, Femi, we need you to do this for blah, 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 blah reason. Will you do it? We don't have any money. There's a show coming up, and people are wondering why I want to stay, like, in a hostel. But again, I'm the kind of person that my band, we're like warriors. If I'm the leader of the band, if you put my band in the toilet to sleep, you can't give me prefer um, preferable treatment. I will not accept it. If we agree to play this gig and we all go to sleep on, in the toilet, then we all sleep in the toilet. We take our money, we go home, then we go to our comfort zone. But if you give my band shit, we'll all eat the shit together. We do the job, come back. I will never, I'm one that will never take, be comfortable and put people in a non-comfort zone. I will never, I've never done that. So people that know me. So somebody like Okpe has been with me for 17 years, going 18. Onometu has been with me for 18 years. There are people in the band that have been with me for, but these are the little things I will do. And they will say, ah, Oga, why will you do this? Again, I would rather you pay my musicians. Don't pay me any money. Make sure you pay my musicians well. And they will say, ah, what about you? I've done this so many times that the band will now say they can't take this money. Okay, can they all give me some of their own money? I'll say, if you give me. But I'm so open with my money that comes to me that they know, like Okpe, for instance, he sees what comes in from a tour. At the end of the tour, Okpe will just say, the band were like devastated because I paid them their salary. and But again, I want loyalty. You don't get loyal. You, you don't, to win loyalty is hard. I got their loyalty. They trust me. They know I will never cheat them. They know they know too much about me in this respect. But this is how I've been. This has been from the day I started Positive Force. These were the standards I set. That when I was in Egypt, I had the opportunity. I was assistant band leader before I became. I began to lead Egypt, and I said, if my father did not meet these standards, I set. Another reason why I will not be there. My father comes from my area, uh, an era where you are the owner of the band, you must be, this is your treatment, and everybody is secondly. I come from an era, I started an era where everybody before myself. And I just thought that for me to succeed, I didn't compare myself with my father or his time. I just thought that the position I am in to sustain what I wanted, this is what I'll have to do. And then when I did what I had to do, I now realize that I can't back, back away from my principle. This is the principle I've set. Again, I'll give one example. So Made joins my band. There's a salary structure. So they come and meet me. So Made is joining your band. Oh, guy, you must put Made because he's bringing a lot to the table. He must come at least over halfway. I said, no. Made will start right from the bottom of the ladder and he will walk his way up. Made cannot come. I will not say, but it's your son. I said, no. And two, let me let you know. Yes, because he's my son. He will, have, he will always have prefer, um, he will always have that special treatment because he's my son. But that is father and son at home. Business, there's, he's not going to have any special treatment. I'm not going to treat him better, better, um, better than you. When we go on tour, Made will share a room with somebody, will not have a room on his own. And if there is no room to share, then Made will share with me. But I'm not going to make anybody uncomfortable because of Made. Now, Made has a point to prove. And he's proving me right and proud because he's bringing more to the table. You could say Made is a star on his own. Made can't survive on his own, even without his father. But Made understands because if he's going to have his own bad, if he's going to be a man, if he's going to have end respect, then he too has to send to set those principles for him and he has to live by them even with his own children if he starts to make his children special then he will spoil them then how do you win loyalty how do you win how do you win respect so a lot of people might not respect me but those close to me that know me will defend me even at the point of death this is true respect what would you say is your weakness I really don't have one. 
Because even when I find it, I capitalize on it to make it strong. We are, we are humans. We must make mistakes. The first mistake you make as a human being is when you don't realize you are human and you are allowed to make mistakes or you are prone to mistakes. So that is your first mistake. And you, even if you, people think you are successful, you are really a failure. When you are arrogant, when you are pompous, those things are, you are already a failure. When I was going up again, a lot of people thought they see me as arrogant. But it wasn't arrogance. It was just I set a standard. And I was not fighting anybody. I was fighting myself that, wow, this is what I expect of myself. Anything less than this is not me. So I was angry at myself. I wasn't even angry at my father. I was just, I took it personally at myself to develop myself. That, okay, yes, my father did this, my father did that. Okay, this was against me. So that is no, I gave myself no excuse not to be successful. That's why I said I'd rather die trying than saying, okay, I can't do it. So if I said, I, I just woke up one and said, I want to do 1,000 press-ups every day. And was, how are you going to do it? I said, there are 24 hours in a day. Abby, I will, if I do 20, I will rest. Do 20. But that 1,000, I will make sure in 24 hours, I've done 1,000. So I had less sleep because I had to do. So when I started with 10 press up, then I could do 20. Then I could do 100 without. Then I could do 150. I be, then I will rest. It, the pain became an incentive to do more. So this was how I, I this is how I have seen today. So if I find, oh, okay, you could say I am weak towards women. But I don't see it as weakness because it would be very hard for a woman to fool me. I'm just, I could be a nice person. So she could lie the first time, take my money, blah, 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 blah. But I will learn. I say, hey, okay. She be you took my money today. Tomorrow, uncle. I will even make a prayer for her. I say, may God not let you need my help again. Because when you come, truly, you know, have you heard the story of the boy that cried wolf? The day you need my help, I will now not give it to you. And I have many of them like that who have hurt me so many times but then they come back and say ah they call me shocky shocky blah 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 I say ah really eh, have you forgotten they say how can i remember so many years back money ah i never forget though i never forget and i don't forgive so when you hurt me i will not forgive you ah and even if i forgive you i will still not forget i will know you as this because you have showed me this is your this is who you are so now it is for you to always now show me for the rest of your whole life that you have you are a changed person. There is somebody like that in my life who had who showed hell, then suddenly everything collapsed in her life. And I helped her. I did help her to show for me it's not a sign of weakness because I was the only person that could help her. And I felt that if God has given me the opportunity to help her, who am I to still judge her or criticize her or whatever? Okay, take. Only one thing I need you to do for me. Don't tell me your pastor told you because every time I help her, she will say, a pastor said that we help her. And I say, eh, don't tell me your pastor. I'm helping you for my, my own God is giving me the privilege, the opportunity, sorry, to help you. Don't tell me, don't come and use your religious gimmicks to come and think you are extorting money from me. And if you ever say that to me again, I will never help you again. So I set some standard for this person and I helped her. So I could do that. Not, again, it's not arrogance. It's just to teach that person that, oh, you took, you are taking my money, taking my money, thinking, and then you go and say, ah, multi four one nine shocky. But I was, I'm a nice guy because I've helped so many people in my life. I met a guy coming on the plane. He was, he plays football in Turkey. He was sitting in business class. He said, excuse me, sir, you don't know me. I said, I don't know you. He said, should I remind you? I came to you one day in Shrine and I needed, nobody helped me to get an international passport and I had no money and I just walked up to you and I just put money in my pocket and gave him the money to go and get his passport. He said he got the passport, got his visa, he's playing professional football in Turkey. He was sitting in business class, he said I owe you everything. I said I don't remember. He, he, he reminded me of so many instances, I still don't remember. 
and they assume because when I had that kind of money, anybody just walked up to me and said, Ah, Shoki, I have not paid my rent. How much is your rent? Ah, uh, 50,000 naira. I, I had it, I gave it. Social media now, people boast of what they have done. I wasn't that kind of person to boast of what I, If I did a favor for you, if I did anything for you, I will never tell anybody I did it. I'm only letting you understand right now the kind of person I am and the principles I set for myself. And one thing you must do to me is don't touch my family. I'm a very protective father. Do anything you like. Kill me, but don't touch my family. You see, my children, my family, leave them out of any of our business. If you see my children, just treat them like the most special thing in your life. And then if you think you are doing that to, you know, we call something in shrine, eye service. If you think you are doing that to, I see clearly. No, but before you fool me today, I will be very hard. Except I want to be fooled, to play along with you. And then because, again, this position, you have to be nice to everybody. So somebody, you know this person is a, excuse my language, a bastard. You just have to be nice to that person. And that bastard might think you are a fool or he or she has fooled you because you are being nice. So, and then some people think I'm being stingy these days. But it's not stingy, it's just that now my responsibility is priority goes to my children. Because if anything happens to me, who will look after my children?